Welcome to Leaders Get Real, inspirational interviews with today's authentic leaders. I'm your host, Christy Tong, bringing you insightful interviews with leaders who are purposeful and passionate and who lead with authenticity and impact. My guest today is Kim Scott, a two-time New York Times bestselling author. In this chat, we discuss her first iconic book, Radical Candor, be a kick-ass boss without losing your humanity. Daniel Pink, author of the bestsellers Drive and A Whole New Mind, says, Kim Scott has a well-earned reputation as a kick-ass boss and a voice that CEOs take seriously. And Sheryl Sandberg, former Facebook COO and author of Lean In, says, reading Radical Candor will help you build, lead, and inspire teams to do the best work of their lives. Kim is a former tech exec leading critical teams with founders at Google, Apple, and YouTube. And she's been coached to CEOs at Dropbox, Qualtrics, Twitter, and more. She's also managed a pediatric clinic in Kosovo and started a diamond cutting factory in Moscow. Now she lives with her family in Silicon Valley. I love this conversation with Kim and I know you'll enjoy it too. I am here with author Kim Scott. Kim, this has been a long time in coming. I have been recommending your book to companies and executives that I coach for years. And we were trying to get an interview on our calendars back before COVID years ago. So I am so jazzed to finally have you on the show. Welcome to Leaders Get Real. Amazing. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. And seriously, I'm being real when I say how often I have recommended your book. I am such a believer because the concepts have prompted such a breakthrough for many of the leaders that I've coached. And if your ears were ever ringing in some of the other episodes, actually, (laughs) where radical candor has come up, or I've mentioned when I was with Liz Wiseman talking about Uh multipliers or Lisa Leahy talking about immunity to change and The themes that you bring out and your way of doing it are just awesome. So I am so fired up to dig into conversation. Well, thank you so much. You've uh, you've you've spoken with some of my favorite writers, so it's uh, I'm I'm glad to be part of your list. And speaking of writers, we're going to have to do another episode just to talk about all the fun books on your shelf and Mm, books that you have been reading recently. But we'll start by talking about one of yours, your first book, Radical Candor. Well, first, let's start with your why about radical candor. What led to your passion for this topic? I think that there is a false belief that a lot of us have, that you have to choose between being a really good, kind person and being successful. There's this notion that we have that people who are successful are jerks. And that is false. That is absolutely false. So I think that's part of it. So I first started thinking about this when I started a company, a software company, and I came into work one day and a bunch of people had emailed me the same article. And it was an article about how people would rather have a boss who's a complete jerk Uh, but really competent than one who's really nice, but incompetent. And I thought, gosh, are they sending me this because they think I'm a jerk or because they think I'm incompetent? And surely (laughs) those are not my two choices. And, and, And so I started sort of thinking about this in the back of my head. And it came to a point one day, shortly after I had taken a new job at Google, and I had to give a presentation to the founders and the CEO about how the AdSense business was doing. And I walked into the room and there was one of the founders on an elliptical trainer stepping away. And probably like you in such a situation, I felt a little bit nervous. How was I supposed to get these people's attention? Luckily for me, the AdSense business was on fire. And when I said how many new customers we had added over the last couple of months, the CEO almost fell off his chair. What did you say? This is incredible. Do you need more marketing dollars? Do you need more engineers? So I'm feeling like the meeting's going all right. In fact, I now believe that I am a genius. Mm-hmm. And I walked out of my I walked out of my room. I walked out of the room as the meeting was over. I walked past my boss and I'm expecting a high five, a pat on the back. And instead my boss says to me, you said um a lot in there. Were you aware of it? And with this, you know, I kind of like, ah, no big deal. I kind of made this brush off gesture. And then she said 
to me, I know this great speech coach. Would you like an introduction? And once again, I made this brush off gesture with my hand. I said, no, I'm busy. I don't have time for a speech coach. Didn't you hear about all those new customers? And then she stopped. She looked me right in the eye and she said, and we're, you know, walking. So this is a private conversation. And she said, I can tell when you do that thing with your hand that I'm going to have to be a lot more direct with you. When you say um, every third word, it makes you sound stupid. <laughs> now she had my full attention. And some people might say it was mean of her to say that I sounded stupid. But in fact, it was the kindest thing she could have done for me at that moment in my career. Because if she hadn't used just those words, and by the way, this is a crucial point, if she if she had been talking to other people on her team who perhaps were a better listener than I, I was, she wouldn't have used those words. But she knew me well enough to know if she didn't use just those words with me that I wouldn't have gone to see the speech coach. And I wouldn't have learned that she was not exaggerating. I literally said, um, every third word. And this was news to me because I've been giving presentations my whole career. Mm -hmm. I had raised money for two different startups giving presentations. I thought I was pretty good at it. And it was almost like I suddenly realized I'd been marching through my whole career with a giant hunk of spinach between my teeth and nobody had had the common courtesy to tell me it was there. And so this really got me to thinking, why had no one told me, but also what was it about my boss that made it so seemingly easy for her to tell me? And I realized that in her case, it, it boiled down to two pretty basic things. She cared personally. She didn't care about me just as an employee, but as a human being. And she was willing to challenge me directly. And caring and challenging hardly sounds so radical that I would call it radical candor. But I've never met anyone who doesn't struggle with feedback at work. And so one of the things that I have tried to do to make these ideas a little bit easier to boil it down to a really simple framework. So if you imagine a, a two by two, so on the vertical line, there's care personally on the horizontal line, there's challenge directly. And in the upper right hand box, that's radical candor. Now I've heard you speak and you've, you've got some nicknames for the vertical axis and the horizontal axis. Yeah. Well, tell us about those. So, so the care personally dimension of radical candor, I think of as the give a damn part of radical candor. That's where you just, you really care about the people who you work with, but the horizontal line, the challenge directly line, that's what I think of as the willing to piss people off dimension of radical candor. And you've got to be able to do both at the same time. You've got to care about that other person enough to be willing to risk uh, pissing them off because you're going to tell them something that it's important for them in the long run to know about. Hmm. I love it. I love it. That quadrant model is exactly what I was talking about when it has been a breakthrough for people. And that notion that you said right at the start, that people feel like it's an either or, mm -hmm. um, that you either have to be nice and caring, a good person, or you've got to actually stretch and challenge people. And that's the be a jerk part that they they don't see how to do both. And so I love that you're bringing that out. And that's been a breakthrough when people have realized somebody who's conflict averse, you know, has realized, ooh, they never go into that quadrant where they're challenging someone directly. They're tiptoeing around yeah. and yeah. They're, or they're avoiding and they're not having those conversations. Yeah. Or the opposite. So I love that you bring together this paradox. And I've been just fascinated as I just watch humans at how hard it is for people to sometimes grasp that both of those things can be true, that you can challenge directly, that you can be very candid and direct, and you can be really caring and yeah. really look out for someone's well-being. So I yeah, love that not model. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's not either or, it's both and. But I mean, sometimes, you know, we do challenge, but we forget to show we care. And that's what I call obnoxious aggression. You know, that's the bottom, right? It's, it's, it's in order to understand radical candor, it's useful to understand what it's not. Mm -hmm. Because one of the mistakes that people make is sometimes I'll be working with a team and someone will charge into the room and they'll say, in the spirit of radical candor, and then they'll proceed to act like a garden variety jerk. And that is not the spirit of radical candor. That is the spirit of obnoxious aggression. 
And obnoxious aggression is a big problem. It's a big problem mostly because it hurts people, but it's also a problem because it's inefficient. If I act like a jerk to you, Christy, then you're likely to go into fight or flight mode and then you can't hear a single word I'm saying. So I'm wasting my breath. But it's also, I think, a problem for a third reason, which is that I don't know about you, but for me, when I realize I've acted like a jerk, it's not my instinct to go the right way on the care personally dimension. Instead, it's my instinct to go the wrong way on challenge directly. Oh, it's no big deal. I didn't really mean it, but it is a big deal. And I did mean it. That's why I said it, you know, and then I wind up in the worst place of all manipulative insincerity. Hmm. That's what happens where we neither care nor challenge, where we're just sort of all about protecting ourselves and our own reputation. And, uh, and, you know, it's fun to tell stories about obnoxious aggression and, and manipulative insincerity. You know, one is front stabbing, the other is backstabbing. But the fact of the matter is most people neither front stab nor backstab. Most people make the vast majority of their mistakes in this last quadrant, where we do remember to show that we care personally, because despite everything that you might observe on social media, most people are actually pretty nice people, you know. Those people are pretty kind, but we're so worried about not hurting someone's feelings or not offending them that we fail to tell them something they'd be better off knowing in the long run. And that is what I call ruinous empathy. Hmm. Fabulous. And this is so relevant for so many, just this, this concept of how do you show up and do both? And I love the subtitle. You can my post-it notes all over the place. Yes. I love the subtitle. I love, I love saying that. Thank you. <laughs> I love the subtitle. Be a kick-ass boss without losing your humanity. Yes. And that is just the, just the beautiful both and. And yeah. yet I find that it's really hard. It's really hard for people to actually try that on and to actually get to a place where that just comes really naturally versus being at one extreme or the other. Yeah. So in, in the chat today, I'm really excited to kind of dig in on this role as a boss. Like if we're in a role as a manager, how can we actually be a kick-ass boss and really show humanity, really make it a place where people feel valued, you know, feel trusted and so on. And I'm also excited to broaden the conversation as well, because I'm a culture first fanatic and I know all throughout the book, you talk about how the things you do as a manager create the culture of your team, ultimately create the ripple effect culture. So let's go there. But first, let's talk about that relationship between a, a leader and people that they're leading. And you've yes. got so many good handles in that. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I think that if you... Consider what do managers do? And by the way, like one of the things that was hard about writing this book is that there's not a good word for the role. Uh, all of the all of the terms, boss, manager, leader, sometimes get used in a derogatory way. <laughs> and uh, and so one of the things I hope to do with the book is to give the, the role a better reputation to help people to rid the world of bad bosses. So if you think about what is the job, what is your job when you're managing another person or a team or a company? And I think no matter what you're doing, the things that you need to do are the same. You need to create this culture of feedback. You need to build a great team and you need to achieve some goal. Am I allowed to curse on your podcast? Go for it. You, you, this you is need to, leaders get real. Kim, yes. Okay. So you, you need to get, get shit done. You know, <laughs> so you, you gotta, you gotta give feedback to a team in order to get shit done. So that that's, those are the three things. And so, you know, I call it guidance in the book. You can call it feedback, but guidance, team, and results. And how do you do that? Like at the center is you. And then if you think about the job in terms of concentric circles, the circle outside of that are the relationships that you form with each of the people on your team. And it's those relationships that are going to allow you to create this culture of guidance, to build a great team, to achieve results. And then the last concentric circle is your culture. 
And all of these things need to be working together. And if you get out of alignment with yourself, then then it's like a, a wheel when it gets out of alignment, it can't spin very fast or maybe even at all. And if your relationships aren't good, then you can't do the things you need to do as as a manager and then your culture collapses also. Great. So let's dive in further into the center of that circle in that relationship between a boss or a, a leader and, and their team members. And you've got so many great tools, you know, back your book has this whole, you know, section on that. One of them is this great table that looks at the two extremes that often happen. And you talk about being a micromanager on one end of the spectrum, being an absentee manager on the other end, which is sort of like the, the leader who either says too much or doesn't say anything at all. And then, yeah. you, and then you talk about this column in the middle of what you're driving for. Say a little bit about what, what we're really driving for. Yeah. So your goal is to be a thought partner with each of the people who are on your team. And, you know, if you think about your relationship with each of your team members, there are very few things that are more destructive to a human relationship than a power imbalance. And so when you're the manager, it's your job to learn how to lay your your power and authority down and a get on a level playing field and really be a thought partner with, with each of each of the people who you're working with. But the mistake that people often make is that they think either they're supposed to know it all and then they wind up micromanaging or they'll have this attitude, you know, oh, my job is just to hire the right people and then get out of their way. And that is like, that's not a great way to have a relationship. I mean, I, I was, when I was coaching Dick Costolo when he was CEO of Twitter, he and I were talking about this and he, he'd say, yeah, imagine Kim, if I called my wife up right now and I said, I'm not going to come home and have dinner with you and the kids tonight because <laughs> I don't want to get in your way, you know, uh, that's not a great way that, that would not end well. And so your, your, your real goal with people is to spend time with them and, and to help them do their work, not to do it for them, not to tell them how to do it and not to be unaware of what they're doing, but, but to get involved with them to, to, to help them succeed. I love it. And you use some great, just clear imagery where you talked about the absentee manager. They've got hands off, ears off, and mouth off. <laughs> yeah. And on the other end, say what they've got on the other end. Yeah. The micro, the micromanager is too hands on. They're just, they're just getting in the way of the person. You know, they're not allowing the person to use their own mind and their own hands. They're telling what to do. So yes, their hands on and their mouth is on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, uh, and you point out and their ears are off. Love it to think about how to be that partner who's in between. Yeah. As a thought partner, you, you want to make sure that you're getting the dirt under your fingernails. You're getting your hands dirty, but you're not, you're not getting in the way. Hmm. Uh, and, and so you're helping people w when they get stuck. But again, you're not telling them how to do it, or your goal is to sort of help people make their own decisions about how they're going to work. Yeah. So they're hands on enough, their mouth off and ears on. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, if you want some of the other language in it, there's the absentee manager lacks curiosity and doesn't want to know the micromanager also lacks curiosity, but pretends to know it all. And the, <laughs> and the thought partner displays curiosity and recognizes when they need to know more. The absentee manager doesn't listen and says nothing. The micromanager doesn't listen and tells how. And the partner listens and asks why. Uh, you know, And there's also like the absentee manager is sort of detail of phobic the micromanager gets lost in the details and the partner knows how to ask about the relevant details. Mm, mm, I love it. There's just some great, great handles in there. Well, let's talk about, I think, one of the most difficult subjects, which is around performance feedback. 
And I see this in so many of the companies that I go to, especially the ones with nice cultures, which there are plenty of. And I see that so often that performance feedback is just not even being given. And I asked someone, when's the last time that you had a real performance conversation? And they kind of pause often. <laughs> You're like, well, uh, I don't know if we ever have had a real conversation or, you know, it's been years and so on. And this just, this just burns me up sometimes when I think about like how much is lost by this. And I can't wait to hear some of your thoughts around this. I see over and over that people, let's say I'm, I'm talking with a director and they want to be promoted to a VP and they'll say every quarter, quarter after quarter, I get exceeds as your performance evaluation, I get exceeds. And yet when it comes to promotions, I'm not promoted and there's no real explanation why. And I was never told you know, what it is that's keeping me until after the fact, when I could have been told that years before <laughs> and been working yeah. on some of those things rather than learn later, well, you know, you just weren't material because. And so what have you seen on this front? And what are your thoughts around how to shift this culture where leaders often are not giving, even though they have a performance review, they still find a way to sort of slide through it without actually being candid. Yeah. So I think one of the things that's important to do is to be very clear about the difference between development conversations and a performance review process. So a lot of what I'm talking about when I talk about these radically candid conversations are th there are these two minute impromptu conversations that sort of hook into a person's intrinsic desire to do better. And so I think that is really important. And, and these are, again, these may be awkward conversations, but they're not super difficult conversations. And by the time you get to a performance review, which is, you know, now we're, now we're out of the development conversation zone and into performance management zone, there should be nothing that's a surprise in that performance review. Great. Now, there's this whole path of finding that art as a leader in giving feedback. And let's, let's take a look at the flip side for a little bit. People who are listening, who has a boss who either isn't reading Radical Candor and deciding to start to implement this and give more direct feedback, or someone who just doesn't have the comfort to do it. So talk about what people can do to get feedback, or even I think you use some terms like demand feedback. And I have seen people who have told their boss, maybe they're a superstar, you know, they want to grow, they want to grow. And so they're like, what can I be doing differently? How can I be more effective? And they're like, you're doing great. You know, don't worry about it. Keep doing what you're doing. And so how can they help someone give them that candid feedback they're looking for? Yeah, th there's an order of operations to radical candor. And this is true whether you're a peer, a boss, or an employee, or you can use this at home too. And no matter who you are, no matter what your role is in the relationship, you want to make sure that you start by soliciting feedback. And so let's pause here. like Because if you say, do you have any feedback for me? You're wasting your breath. I can already tell you the answer. Oh, no, <laughs> everything's fine. Nobody whether it's your boss or your employee or your peer. I mean, the only person in your life who wants to give you feedback is your teenage child, if you have one of those. <laughs> they want to give you feedback, but nobody else <laughs> genuinely is eager to give you feedback. And so what can you do? What can you do? How can you, how can you make this converse, make it more likely that the person will actually say something? I think the first thing to do is to think very consciously about how you're going to ask, like, what are the words that will come out of your mouth? The question that I like to ask is, what could I do or stop doing that would make it easier to work with me? But do not write down that question, because if you sound like Kim Scott and not like yourself, the other person is not going to really believe you want the answer and you're not going to get anything. The important thing about your go-to question is, A, that it sounds like you, that it is authentic. B that you also are paying attention to the impact 
that your words have on the other person. You're, d- being authentic doesn't mean ignoring the impact that you have on others. <laughs> so for example, I like my question. A lot of the people that I have worked with like my question. It's been effective overall for me. But Jason Rosoff, who is my co-founder at Radical Candor, told me after we had worked together for about a month, he said, I hate your question, Kim. And he said, it's too open-ended. It's too broad. It stresses me out. So I have to adjust for him. So I can be authentic to myself and adjust for his needs without losing my authenticity. That's important. And the other thing that's important about your question is that it can't be answered with a yes or a no. So not, is there anything I could do or stop doing, but what could I do or stop doing? And so if everyone listening can pull out, a, as long, don't do this if you're driving, but <laughs> as, long as, as long as you're in a safe place, pull out a pen and write down what is your go, go-to question? Like what are the words that you can imagine actually coming out of your mouth Who are you going to ask that question of and when are you going to ask it? If you can do those three things, it will really help you begin to prove that you want the radical candor. And then that will create an opportunity for other people to give it to you, but it'll also make it easier for you to give it to them. Mm. I love that order of operations because if a leader who is even a bit uneasy about giving feedback. If they start by asking the question to show I'm open to feedback, boy, is somebody going to be open in an entirely different way if they're then given feedback when they've been open to hear it themselves. Yeah. So So that's number one in the order of operations is you want to solicit feedback. Now, the step number two is to, to give praise. I think very often people imagine that radical candor is about the boss criticizing the employee. And that is not what it's about. Again, no matter what your role is in the relationship, you want to make sure that you're focused on the good stuff, that you're giving voice to what you appreciate about this person, that you're expressing gratitude, like all of these things. There's so much evidence that show that when you do these things, they, they, improve your own mood, they improve your relationship, and they improve your work. So you want to focus on the good stuff. Now, this is not, I'm not talking about the the shit sandwich, you know. <laughs> you, you need to say, you need to give voice to the things that you genuinely are grateful for, that you really do admire, you know, mm-hmm. that, that you want to be specific and sincere with your praise. And so having solicited feedback and taking a moment to focus on the good stuff, now it makes sense. It's easier. It becomes much easier for you to give criticism. And when you are giving criticism, whether it's to your boss or to anyone else, you want to make sure that you are humble, that you're not saying, I'm going to tell you the truth. I call it candor and not truth because Mm -hmm. candor implies that you're going to this person, you're saying, here's how I understand the situation. I also want to know how you understand the situation. It's, it's bi-directional. You want to state your t- intention to be helpful. You want to do it immediately. The longer you hold on to things, the less valuable they are. You want to make sure that you're having these conversations. I used to say in person. Now I say synchronously because often we're not in person. But do it on the phone. Don't send an email. It needs to be a conversation, a bi-directional conversational. It's a dialogue, not a monologue. You want to praise in public, criticize in private. If you want an acronym to remember all that, it's hippie, humble, helpful, (laughs) in person, immediately, praise in public, criticize in private. So there you go. Okay. So everybody, listeners, you can press pause because you just got a whole bunch of nuggets in there. (laughs) I remembered from a talk of yours, H-I-P-P, humble, immediate, and praise in public, criticism in private. And I think so often we just shoot from the hip, but what a wonderful new acronym in terms of, and you're going to communicate from the hip to use that H-I-P-P golden rule of thumb there. So good stuff. Well, you said something a few moments ago that maybe makes a segue in talking about this broader piece of the culture that we're creating. You said that radical candor is not just about a boss criticizing an employee. 
And so I'm excited to get to this conversation about this vision that you create through your work and that I've seen as well is this vision of organizations where there is radical candor in all directions, that it's this healthy, thriving place and has such a different feel than a place where there's sort of what Pat Lincioni, I know he calls toxic harmony. Love, yeah, that's uh, sort of ruinous empathy plus manipulative insincerity. It's yes. toxic harmony. So there's some misperceptions about the culture. There's nice cultures. There's ones that have toxic harmony or there's passive aggressive cultures and so on. And let's just talk for a start about, you know, some headlines of what that looks like when a whole organization or a whole team is operating in all directions, perhaps with radical candor. So when, when a whole team is operating in a radically candid way, basically what happens is mistakes get fixed much more quickly. Relationship problems that we have with people, which we are all bound to have, disagreements or even like, you know, you offended me. These things don't blow up. They don't fester and then blow up like a dirty bomb all over your relationship. But instead, we resolve conflict more quickly. We don't keep making the same mistake over and over and over again. And so it's more fun to work in that environment. And we're also more successful when we work that way. I've written an article recent, recently with Amy Edmondson about how ra the seeds of psychological safety are sown in radical candor. And, and there's enormous evidence that shows that when an organization, when everyone on a team feels like if they notice something, they can point it out so that it gets fixed, that those teams are more successful. They have, they have terrific. And that's exactly what I imagine talking about next. You went right there to psychological safety. And so let's talk about what leaders can do to create psychological safety. So people will speak up, will share counter ideas, will give feedback that can make everyone better. So one of the most important things that leaders can do, I'm going to go back to soliciting feedback. Like not only should you ask the question, no matter how good your question is, the other person is still going to be reluctant to speak up. And the only way out of that discomfort is through. So you want to close your mouth, count to six. I only made it to three just there and it was getting very uncomfortable. Almost no one can make it to six seconds of silence and, and let the other person say the thing that is on their mind. And, and it doesn't have to be the most profound thing in the world, but because that kind of silence can be so uncomfortable, they'll, they'll probably tell you something. And that's great. That's awesome. But the problem is now you've dragged this poor soul out on a conversational limb that they never wanted to go on. So how you respond next is crucial. You've got to the third thing you need to do when you're soliciting feedback. So you've asked your go-to question, you've embraced the discomfort, now you've heard the thing. The third thing you need to do is you need to listen with the intent to understand, not to respond. Because one of the biggest problems with communication is the illusion that it has happened. So all too often we think that we've understood what the other person said, but they actually meant something entirely different. So for example, my daughter told me at breakfast, she said, mom, I wish you weren't the radical candor lady. And immediately this wave of parental guilt washed over me. And I thought, oh gosh, she wishes that, that I were spending more time with her. I'm spending too much time at work. And then I thought, well, I should make sure I really understand what she's saying to me. And so I said, well, who do you wish I were? And she said, I wish you were the lady who minded her own business. <laughs> and so, so she meant something entirely. I could spend a little more time at work as far as she was concerned. And so you want to make sure that you're really getting curious and that you're asking some follow-up questions, that you're listening with the intent to understand. You're not immediately jumping into defensive mode. And it's okay if you ask for feedback and you feel a little bit defensive. I mean, it's normal. It's very human. 
but you know, you can't control how someone else feels. You can't manage someone else's emotions at, at best you can manage your own. So now you've really heard what the person is saying. The last thing you need to do, the fourth step, is to reward the candor. And if you agree with the feedback, that's pretty easy. You fix the problem and then you go back and you say, I heard your feedback. Here's how I fixed the problem. Did I overcorrect? Did I not go far enough? So you make your listening tangible by fixing, the, not saying thank you for the feedback is never enough. But what do you do if you disagree with the feedback? The most important thing you can do if you disagree with the feedback is to look for that five or 10% overlap between what that person said and what you agree with and give voice to that just to demonstrate that you're not shut down to feedback, that you're open to it, that you're listening to what they said. But then say, as for the rest of it, can I think about it and get back to you? And then you got to get back to them and you got to explain why you disagree. And this is hard because I think it's instinctive for us to feel like disagreements pose a risk to our relationships, but it's not actually the disagreements that we give voice to that are, that pose the biggest risk to our relationships. It's the disagreements that fester that mm -hmm. pose the biggest risk to our relationships. And so sometimes the best reward that you can give someone for their candor is a forthright, respectful explanation of why you disagree. And at a certain point, you sort of have to listen, challenge, commit. And the more often when there's a disagreement with no clear answer, the more often you can defer to what the other person wants to do instead of, <laughs> instead of demanding that they do it your way, the more you make your listening tangible. But at least now you've communicated, no matter which way you decide to go. Russ Laraway, who was a colleague of mine for many years, used to say to his employees, he said, if we have data, let's do what the data says. If all we have are opinions, let's go with yours. <laughs> I love it. Now, when you were going through these, those steps, I, I had this flashback to years ago, I was consulting a company and it was an all hands with a CEO and all the employees. And it got to the Q&A and one of the employees stood up and asked the question to the CEO, why is it that your salary is so disproportionately high than everyone else's? <laughs> it's like, oh, you know, it's like you could hear everybody That's take a, a breath question. in the room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was some radical candor. Yeah. And oh my gosh, everybody else is looking around like, oh, career limiting move. Uh, today yeah. was your last day. And... The CEO stopped and everybody was holding their breath. And he said, thank you for asking that question. The first thing I want to do before I answer it is this. And he stood up and he started applauding. He said, wow. I want everyone to give this person a standing ovation. And he wow. said, I want to thank you and applaud you because if that was a question on your mind, it very well may have been a question on a lot of people's minds yes. and you had the courage to say it. Wow. That, and, that was, and, it, <laughs> and, the, and then what did he say? <laughs> well, I, I just had that flashback to, to the fact that you have to be so explicitly proactive to yeah. create that culture. When you got to the fourth one and you said, reward it. Yes. And what I, I mean, I, for years I've seen people in companies, leaders saying, I have an open door policy. You can come to me about anything or the proverbial yeah. suggestion box. It can be anonymous, but we want to hear what you think. And still people don't do it. And so yeah. I'm curious, you've seen a lot. You've seen a lot. What are some things that were just almost symbolic or proactive that a company or a leader has done to make sure everybody knows there's safety here or we're going to reward yeah. you for speaking up. I'm sure that you've seen some kind of fun either rituals or, or some yeah. things. Yeah. I really like that the CEO applauded him and, and said, you know, I would have liked it better if he had 
giving him a big bonus <laughs> out of his own <laughs> out of his own you know like I, I i i just have to say that ceo pay has gotten out of control but that's a whole other topic uh anyway <laughs> so i think i think that rewarding the candor most often looks like fixing the problem so for example at one point when i was working at google we had this management fix it week and we took an instance of the bug tracking system and instead of filing bugs everyone filed things that bugged them about the way management work <laughs> you know things that were irritating at work <laughs> and there was one guy who filed a bug about how long it took him in order to get someone to cover him so he could go to the restroom it was ridiculous how this group of people who prided themselves in being reasonable and efficient managed to allow this system to, but it was it took him 20 minutes to to you know go to the bathroom for 2 minutes and when he described i just remember my boss when she heard this she she just she clutched her head and she said i am so sorry <laughs> you know and and here's uh, who on my team and she looked at her direct reports who is going to fix this <laughs> and then it got fixed and it got announced so more than anything else that she could have done like first of all like visibly feeling his pain and and like sharing that she felt ashamed that this had, this had come to pass on a team that she was leading and then insisting that it got fixed and then it did get fixed and and people were really happy so fixing problems that people point out is by far the best thing you can do but i've seen other leaders they would write their own sort of self critical performance review and then they would send it out to the whole company and they'd say help me help me with this and that was great at one point i had what i called a radical bander because somebody who worked for me told me that i was interrupting him and so i wore a big rubber band around my wrist and i told my team i said if you hear me you know russ told me that i interrupt him i'm sure i'm in interrupting all of you if you're sitting next to me and I interrupt someone, snap the rubber band and you'll help me, Love you it. know. So so making making the reward for someone telling you it needs to be fun to tell you that you're wrong. Like at one point I had a <laughs> I had a big statue, a uh, big glass trophy that some customer had given us. And I, I would go put it on people's desk. It was called the I was wrong, you were right statue. So the more <laughs> theatrical you can be about showing that you're open to feedback, the better. Oh, I love those. And I was about to interrupt you to say, I need a band. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, a radical bander. I, yes. I, I need one of those as well. It's one of my big, big annoyances, I'm sure, for others that I'm I'm working on. So I got to get one of those yeah. bands. I love it. Those tangible, tangible examples. But it does. It takes being really proactive, having something that's really visible and really overt to overturn some of those things to say, nope, it's okay to give feedback. It's okay. It's safe in this environment. Such good examples. As we think about culture, I know today we're focusing so much because there's so much to talk about from your first book, Radical Candor, but you've written a second book as well. Yes. And that is about just work or in fact, creating just work and really figuring out how to create a culture of radical respect. And I, you know, the aspects around diversity, equity, inclusion are so important in thinking about an environment of radical candor. There, there's a lot of nuances that come up in that arena. And so we'll have a whole nother conversation <laughs> because Great. you've done an incredible deep dive. But do you want to just say a few headlines or anything that comes to mind when you think about this combination of striving for a radical candor culture, but also thinking about an inclusive or just culture. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that a radically candid culture is essential to creating a just culture. And at the same time, I think I didn't in radical candor take into account enough the extent to which bias, prejudice and bullying can masquerade as feedback. Mm -hmm. And so in in 
Just Work, and by the way, that I'm going to be radically candid and say the title Just Work just didn't work. I, I meant justice, <laughs> not just work all the time, but that didn't come across. So we're going to call the paperback Radical Respect. In order to create a great culture, a truly radically candid culture, you need to be able to distinguish between bias, prejudice, and bullying, and you need to be able to respond to each differently. I think very often we conflate bias, prejudice, and bullying as though they're the same thing. And they're actually three different things. Bias is not meaning it. It's unconscious. Prejudice is meaning it. It's a very consciously held belief, usually reflecting an unfair and inaccurate stereotype. And bullying is being mean. There's usually no belief, conscious or unconscious, going on there at all. And figuring out what we can do as leaders to prevent bias and prejudice and bullying from, from messing up our culture and making it more difficult to be radically candid and to solicit radical candor. Figuring out what we can do as upstanders when we notice bias, prejudice, and bullying happening to people on our team figuring out what we can do when we're harmed by bias, prejudice, and bullying, how to respond, and also figuring out what we can do when we're the person who was biased or prejudiced or bullied. And we all do these things. Like there's not a person on the planet, I don't think, who has no, who is completely and perfectly unbiased. And so that's what that the next book, Radical Respect, is all about. Fabulous. There are so many rich elements of that. I can't wait to dig into that further as well. Well, we've been talking about the bigger picture of creating a culture of radical candor, and you have spoken to how much competitive advantage there is, really. And when you talked about, you know, that everybody gets better when you're giving that feedback, you improve things, you got higher productivity, less drama, and fun, <laughs> even yeah. when people can actually be their authentic selves and be honest about these things and work through them. So really, really neat to get to talk through the aspects around that. And now as I think about timing and wrapping up, uh, since we've come to the end of our time, listeners always love to have a takeaway. And you've been saying a lot of practical things along the way, but I always like to ask my guest, what is one thing, one or two, that listeners can do in the next 24 hours, in the next 24 hours, or they could take action on this stuff? Think about who you need to solicit feedback from. Go back. I, I recommended that you write down your go-to question. So think about who you're going to ask to give you feedback write down the question and put in your calendar, like, when are you going to do this and do it? You will find that when you can solicit feedback and don't dish it out before you prove you can take it, you'll find that that really helps build a culture of radical candor. Excellent. Well, Kim, this has been fabulous. This was like the tip of the iceberg. There's so many, so many things in your work and in your book. So I was about to ask you to share, where can people find you and what are some of the resources? And first of all, get the book if you haven't yet. Please. Yes, buy and, the book. <laughs> and now we're going to get excited about Radical Respect coming out to bring forth ideas you have in your second book. And tell us what else can listeners look for in terms of the great resources. Sure. If you go to radicalcandor.com, you'll find we have a podcast, we have a blog, we have a lot of a lot of different resources there. We also have, have made some courses that are fun. In fact, we made a sitcom of Radical Candor. It's called The Feedback Loop. We made that with Second City. So you can check that out. You can follow me on LinkedIn. So check us out there. Fabulous. Well, Kim, you have been just groundbreaking in terms of really bringing this concept out into the forefront. And it's been transforming leaders. It's been transforming companies. And for anyone listening, I know that there's been just such great insights for themselves personally and for changing the atmosphere of their teams and their companies. So thank you, Kim, for taking so much time today. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the conversation, Christy. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you'd like to see show notes and resources from today's show or get alerts about new episodes, go to leadersgetreal.com. 
There, you'll also find many compelling interviews with top authors and authentic leaders. If you enjoyed today's interview, please share it with a friend or a colleague. You can find Leaders Get Real in video, on YouTube, and at your favorite podcast app. And to help spread the word, please follow and like on LinkedIn, Instagram, and iTunes. And be sure to comment. You may just win a book. Thanks for listening. And until next time, go forth and get real. Get real.